You're listening to Trek FM. Welcome to From There to Here, Trek FM's 50th anniversary rewatch project, where the hosts of the network get together and discuss for you all 729 episodes and movies in the Star Trek franchise. And today we've got two episodes from Season 4 of Voyager, Scorpion Part 2, and The Gift. And joining me from Stage 9 is one of two, Mike Schindler. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. How, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. We're gonna we're gonna talk about a uh, an addition and a subtraction to the uh, Voyager series. Yes, we are excellent. So first, we've got Scorpion Part Two, which is the conclusion to the epic cliffhanger of a ship flying away from us, which kept us on the edge of our seats all summer, uh, where Janeway finds out. A little bit more information about this species 8472 and how it's actually the Borg's fault for going into their space. And hijinks ensue. Yeah. Okay, so yesterday we we talked a lot about Scorpion uh, in general and and Part 1 in specific. And and I kept on saying, like, but there's a thing. And I was holding off for this episode because this is the episode where 7 of 9 is introduced. And... Because of that, I think that even though Scorpion is not nearly the best episode of Voyager, it is, in a lot of ways, the most important episode of Voyager. Because I think that Seven of Nine is essentially what Voyager was missing, you know, and and I'm I'm not being revolutionary in that, you know, uh, take on on the subject or anything like that. I think a lot of people... I think a lot of people think that that Seven of Nine is was the missing ingredient, and once you bring her onto the show, there is sort of like a quantum leap forward in terms of of quality because of the the stories that they're able to tell. Uh, n- not to mention the fact that you know you're able to tell stories with you know this character specifically, who I think is maybe the best character on the show. Maybe not, but I, certainly she's up there. And it, it certainly led to a lot of very, very interesting stories. And I think that while Scorpion Part 2 did not knock my socks off by any stretch of the imagination, even though I did think it was very good, I think that because of what happens in Scorpion Part 2, because Seven of Nine is introduced... Season four and season five in particular of Voyager are the best seasons of the show. I think they are um, excellent, actually. I know I have a reputation for not liking Voyager. I know that uh, some people online have been critical of From There to Here for uh, not liking Voyager. And, you know, I'm not going to apologize for that because it's how I feel and I think that if I were to say, hey, it's all good, that's that would be disingenuous of me. But I do think that just like all the other shows, Voyager had some growing pains, and this is the point where it takes off and becomes really, really good. Mm-hmm. I agree with you a lot. When we were talking yesterday about how Jerry Ryan was coming on, and when this came out, so this was what? 1996? 90, no, this is 1997, I believe it was. Uh, yeah, yeah fall of 97. Yeah, okay, yeah. so I was 16. Which, by the way, this was right before uh, Boogie Nights was released in theaters. <laughs> uh, I was 16 years old when Scorpion Part Two came out, and I was extremely upset when they brought Jerry Ryan on because I always felt that Star Trek was better than a hot babe. And Jerry Ryan is a hot babe. And she looks fantastic in her catsuit outfits. And I was very upset that they brought her on for this. I'm like, I want good storytelling. And this is really where Voyager lost me the first time that I watched it when I was airing. I watched four, I watched five, but I never really gave the show a chance because of the addition of Seven of Nine. And I didn't even watch season six or seven while they were airing. 
And I didn't actually see them again until I bought them all on DVD, which was in the early 2000s. And when I got to season four and started watching this and started realizing the stories and what Seven of Nine actually brought to the series, I was like, holy smokes, like, I I can't believe I didn't see any of this when the show was first on the air. Like, there are absolutely some really, really, really good episodes that I don't think you could have done without the Seven of Nine character added to the mix. Yeah, you know, um, I... I, I felt the same way i think everyone felt the same way you know when because surface level you know which is kind of weird it's it's kind of like I- ironic in a sense because they're like oh you know viewers I, you know I was star trek fans you know like oh look at them being so cheap you know it's such a cheap ploy you know you bring on like a hot woman to boost ratings you're completely selling out you're completely sacrificing you know any sort of like artistic integrity in the name of you know just like selling sex and you know then what you get what people miss you know because they're sort of like blinded by the uh by the, you know, sort of like crass commercialism, which was certainly at play, is that in addition to that, you're also getting, you know, a substantial upgrade in terms of content. You're getting a substantial upgrade in terms of story because of what they're doing with this character who, you know, they're basically trying to cash in on because of her sex appeal, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Because it's like they, they've got a business, obviously. They're going to be looking at things through sort of like a business mind. But for the artistic side to be able to cut through that and say, like, you know, we're going to take this, you know, this, this situation and turn it into a positive. I mean, it's it's really, you know, creatively speaking, it's, it's really interesting and sort of just like mind-blowing that something would actually work out as well as it did, given the circumstances. Yeah, so I mentioned yesterday how, you know, Scorpion Part 1 was in the same spot as Best of Both Worlds Part 1, right? With the uh, with the Borg cliffhanger and everything like that. Well, this episode's in the same spot as The Way of the Warrior, right? The first episode of Season 4, right? And this is when they shook up Deep Space Nine. Now, they didn't get rid of anybody. I mean, Jake was never really a major character in the show, right? He got billing the whole time, but he was never really there. But I mean, this is when they brought Worf in, and that that stirred up the show pretty good and did a really good a really good thing for Deep Space Nine. And, you know, this turned out to be as well. All right. Know. Well, should we move on to our second episode today? Sure. We have the gift. Which so, does not star Keanu Reeves or Katie Holmes, but <laughs> is good nonetheless. Kess starts exhibiting mental powers in a similar vein of Gary Mitchell, circa Where No Man Has Gone Before, where she can bring things to her with just the power of her mind. And uh, she starts to turn all fuzzy and white, and she has to say goodbye to the crew. Yeah, she she totally pulls an Indiana Jones here. She left just when she was becoming interesting. Yeah, you think she was just becoming interesting this time? I, you know, I was just trying to quote Indiana Jones in the Last <laughs> Crusade, man. Okay, my point is that the character was becoming really interesting, and they started really doing some crazy outside of the box thinking with this this character, which I think was is pretty awesome, and which is something that. Star Trek does not do nearly as much as it should. And I can understand why, because it's hard for people to relate to, because it is so alien, in a sense. You know, I mean, Star Trek is is, is a show which primarily is using the science fiction conceit as a way to tell stories about Earth today. And, you know, aliens, you know, for all their alienness more than anything exist as proxies for, you know, different nations here on Earth and that kind of thing. But you've also got a scenario here, Star Trek, where you can do crazy, crazy things with with aliens and life forms and everything like that. And taking it into this level of, like, stuff which is so completely foreign that, that people can't even relate to it, I think is really interesting. I mean, this is why I like the stuff with the Traveler and everything like that. And, you know, Kess is, is reaching that point. And uh, I think that it's, it's really cool. And I wish we could have seen this explored further 
you know, I know that it was kind of all leading up to this and there's this thing bubbling beneath the surface, but here's where she takes it to another level and it's like, and now she's gone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's cool. And, you know, this episode was written by Joe Minoski and it's classic Minoski and it's one of the reasons why uh, I think a lot of us are excited that he's uh, going to be working on the new show. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is like one of the first times where I was like really super excited uh, to see Kess in an episode, and now she's gone. Mm-hmm. Sad. Well, I too shall quote Indiana Jones here. Why did it have to be snakes? Not that that has anything to do with what we're talking about. I just wanted to quote Indiana Jones my okay. way here. All right, that's cool. But what did you think of the gift that she had by pushing them an extra 10,000 light years? Like, I like that myself because it gave them another... So they, they've just really spiced everything up by adding Seven of Nine. And now they've really opened up and they've, they've severed a lot of ties with this episode by doing that. It's like everything we've been leading up to now, we can't do anymore. Any aliens that we've seen, you know, we definitely can't see the Kazon Ogla anymore now, right? Which is a good thing. I know we haven't seen them for a year. But, but um, you know, they've, they've now put them in a completely different area of the galaxy. In this case, the light years are the mileage. What? Let's see how long we can keep this up, shall we? <laughs> no, I think that I think that it is cool. I mean, it's one of those things where you know you have to take these shortcuts and everything like that, and it, it, it really is, they can pretty much do it whenever they want because you're never going to have a show on the air for seventy five years unless you're The Simpsons. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's it's interesting. It's interesting that they did that, and yeah, they did get past Borg space, and I think in a lot of ways they kind of needed to do that because sooner or later, if you're going to be in Borg space, you're going to get killed, right? Yeah, you're going to get killed. But they're past Borg space, and then they have the Borg every other episode. They still do. So can you imagine how much they'd be in the show if they weren't past <laughs> Borg space? You know, <laughs> so I think it's cool. I thought I thought it was cool. You know, it was a nice little gift or whatever and and it was it was interesting mm-hmm. yeah right on yeah it's it's interesting because we we if you didn't know it was going to be jerry Ryan or um uh jennifer lean that's leaving i mean her name's not even in the main credits for these two episodes that she's in she's a, she's the first person who's also starring as yeah in in the credits and whatnot but Anywho, it's uh definitely they've shuffled the deck here and they've uh they've dealt a whole new game now Anywho, well, where can people find you when you're not uh, pushing your friends 10,000 light years closer to home? Uh, you can find me uh, on Stage 9, uh, where we talk about the people who make Star Trek, like Joe Minoski. And you can also find me on Twitter at Mumbles3K. And you can find me at Brandon Metella on Twitter or on the Babel Conference, which is our Trek FM listeners-only group. And you can find me with new episodes of Melodic Treks. So join us tomorrow as we finish up our block together with two more episodes of Voyager, Day of Honor, and Nemesis.